Hello, Musical Talk, and welcome to... Musical Talk. <laughs> musical Talk. This is Musical Talk. Musical Talk. The UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Musical, musical talk. talk. The UK independent musical theatre podcast. Oh. Hello, welcome to this week's episode of Musical Talk. My name is Nick Hudson. Today you're going to hear a discussion that I had with my good friend Dominic McChesney about Kinky Boots, which is the Cindy Lauper and Harvey Feierstein musical that is playing at the Adelphi Theatre in London's West End. We haven't really touched on the show much on Musical Talk, so I thought he and I would tootle along to the Strand and uh, take a look at the show. And this is what we had to say about the piece. Today, Nick Hudson and I are going to discuss um, a show that we saw last night, which is the London production of Kinky Boots. Yes. A new musical based on a true story. Based on a film. Based on a film. Based on a t-shirt. Uh, based on a boot. No, no. <laughs> a reboot. <laughs> not the reboot. Not just yet. So, Nick, we, we chose to see this musical, or you chose to see this musical, mm. and neither of us had seen it, and this is the London production. Was there anything that you... What did you know about it beforehand? I knew that I had attempted to listen to the cast recording a couple of times and didn't make it through any of the songs. Right. You and I share this disdain of pop song writers sitting down to write musicals. Yes. Uh, I'm highly suspicious of it. I, I find that, personally, they don't always capture musical theatre. Even though it's not my taste, I do acknowledge that they have a place in the... Um, repertoire. Well, the repertoire and also the maybe the development, whether I like it or not, the, the development of musical theatre. And they certainly have introduced new generations to musical theatre and maybe have brought in people who had never gone and seen a musical. A, a bit of behind-the-scenes, listeners, this is the fourth time we've recorded this or a discussion we just come up with so many different thoughts about it since last night and i think we yes. this is our definitive discussion on on the the piece yes i asked you a question this morning about if you were to come up with three pros and three cons yes of the piece let's start with the pros because that's always a good place to start yes you and I both agree that, and, and a lot of reviewers point this out, was a performer called Amy Lennox, yes. who plays a character called Lauren, is yeah, that that's her, right, her yes. name? Um, the kind of com romantic, musical comedy style secondary romantic interest for the, the, the lead. Well, she's actually the first romantic inset interest. In, um, romantic insect. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> incest. Well, she's actually the, the romantic interest, the the other character Nicola played by Amy Ross it sadly doesn't have much to do no. she doesn't have a song she's just there as an an antagonist mm. to for the plot sort of thing and she's uh, Charlie's husband Charlie's fiance uh, yeah she's not Charlie's husband <laughs> I'm still very tired um, <laughs> let's just say quickly what the story is uh, based on based on a true story yes a uh, factory in Northampton is uh, on its last legs you could say yes the owner, who's a third-generation young guy, his father passes away, and he meets a drag queen um, who kind of pre presents him with a gap in the market for there aren't any, there aren't any high-heeled shoes strong enough to support a man. Correct, yes. And thus, two and a half hours of hilarity ensues. <laughs> Indeed. Will he save the factory? Will he take over his father's place? And will they be able to get to Milan to do the fashion show? Book by Harvey Feierstein, music yes. and lyrics by Cindy Lauper and Stephen Aramis. Um I'll slip that in there for reasons we'll explain later. And uh, direction and choreography by Jerry Mitchell. Yes. Starring Kieran Donnelly and Matt Henry. Going back to Amy Lennox, we were, yes. we were talking about the, the three pros. Yes. I mean, you, you mentioned this, and, and uh, she was... She is a pro. She is an absolute... She's fantastic. She's a delight to watch on stage. Her big number is is fantastic. I mean, for me, she stole the show. Mm. Um, she... You turned to me after that song and said, oh, I'm awake now. Yeah, it was the first time that I'd really properly paid attention. I, I, the other bits, I'd just been drifting off. Um, or just kind of zoning out. It, it, she was funny. She, we'll talk about the American accents. It, it suddenly became context. She sang her song and she was singing in the American accent, which, which per, was perfect for her number. 
she's also one of those performers that I can imagine should be a delight in anything. She makes it look effortless, but you know she's working her socks off up there, mm-hmm. which is real star quality. I mean, it really was very, very good. For my, my second one, which you said is all the same, but I'm going to say this is my second one, is that also Matt Henry, who plays Lola, I thought he was an excellent performer. He was... You know, a delight to watch on stage, very good actor, singer, dancer and performer. And I I really enjoyed his performance. My third one is that as an ensemble, the cast are good. I felt they were committed to the piece. They They were singing well. They were performing well. And they looked like they were having a great time. A great time. Oh, I'm going to add a fourth one here, which is that the audience we saw it with were obviously enjoying themselves, were cheering, were clapping, were standing up at the end. It did create a feel-good show. I'd like to share another um, praise. The reason I mentioned music by Cindy Lauper and Stephen Aramis is a lot of the musical interest came from what the orchestra were doing and not so much what the singers were doing. Now, the general rule is that if you write a melody to a song, you get credited with writing all the music for that song, and, and, right. I, and I disagree with that. I think it's part what is happening on stage, and it's part what is happening in the orchestra. Let's take the tango song as an example, which is called What a Woman Wants. Yes. I thought What Lola Wants would have been a better title, but that's going back to but um, it's, another musical. It is, but it, it, it's not about What, what Lola Wants, because no. it's not. It's he's, he's actually saying this is what women want. He's not saying what, what he wants. Yes. Let me enjoy my pun. Oh, sorry. Am I um, stepping on your... You're stepping, stepping on again. my toes. Sorry. <laughs> In your very high-inch heels. Yes, I know. They're, they're beginning to ache a bit now. I... So we had a tango song. The tango was purely dictated by what the orchestra were doing. The melody was nothing like a tango. True. The vocal ranges of the songs are all over the place. They're very high, they're very low. They, you... and, and yet I, I still felt that they were all one note. Yeah. <laughs> Much like the show, in a way. It's very... One note. Hitting you with this message over and over and over again. A friend well, of mine said on Facebook it's, it, it borders on propaganda. I, I, I disagree with that. I don't... Because I, I think the message is there... And I, but I don't think it it hitting you hit over the head. I think it's because I think that it's weak. Stiletto. I don't think it's that strong a message. Yeah. In this day and age, and and the climate of the world, and and just with the way that people of all different um, things struggle for uh, mm. acceptance, I, I don't think you can ever stop. Uh, pushing for that, I think that's important. It's very, very important that people uh, push for acceptance at all, uh, on any level, be it about gender, be it about race, or anything. I think that's it's important. However, this is not actually strong enough to do that because it won't. It doesn't know what it actually wants to be. The the, the message has been kind of oozed in there. I don't think it's propaganda at all. It's been squeezed in there as a kind of, oh, let's try and give it some weight. But it's not. It doesn't give it actually weight. weight. Well, yeah, it does. It, it's try and give it some welly. And it, it's actually not that strong. It's a sideline. Um, we spoke to Ruben last night. Mm. You, and, um, and he was saying that, and you said that it almost will be better put in the 80s. And the struggles of the gay characters being accepted and the, and the AIDS crisis and, and the AIDS crisis and the music would, sound and the music sound but that would have made it all very relevant to the 80s and maybe would have given it a bit hard hitting thinking about that now would that have been too much I, I think it would in the end this is a popcorn musical it's a piece of light fluff with a message kind of tacked on to it I, I don't think it's um, being shoved in your face I don't think it's being propaganda it's it's just lightly tacked on there with not real conviction I think Harvey Feistin's book is very witty at times it's very witty at times and I really enjoyed it and there's some very very laugh out loud moments and some jokes that really got me but they are him doing it's his stick. His drag queen shtick. Mm-hmm. They're, they're all things from Torch Song Trilogy, sort of that that thing. Now, if it's if it works, if it's not broken, don't fix it. The appeal for the show is oh, always going to be people who go to see musicals who don't like musicals because they want to see something that has just got loud songs that don't actually 
mean anything. And these songs are very loud. Oh, they're very loud. I mean, too often you can't hear the lyrics, which is not one worth of... hearing. I found well, no. I mean, and I don't like songs where you sit there going, "Yeah, but what are you actually saying? What? What? Literally, is what this? are you saying? Because yeah. I cannot hear you. Well, that that, and also, it's it's I You're too loud. I can't. Hear well, you. it's convoluted. Um, it's convoluted lyrics that are pretending to be deep, and they're not deep. I found with a lot of the songs, they make a point at the beginning. And they just repeat that point over and over and over again, and then the song ends. And, and put in a few yeah yeahs and a big note at the and end. And everybody says yeah at the end. Exactly. And they sing the last note for three weeks, and everyone cheers. Yes. So I could turn off during the songs. I was more interested in the bit between the songs, because that's where all the action was happening. Yes, yes. At one I mean, point when there was an argument yeah. going on, a bit of a random argument in Act 2, where Charlie changes his persona. It was all a bit quick. And it I didn't thought, build. why isn't this a song? Oh, I'm glad it wasn't. But, it, it's, but it, in a musical, if it were a proper comedy, musical written by someone who understands the art of musical writing, it would have been a, a good song. Absolutely, it would have been a, a, a double, um, a duet, which would have built, 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 and built, and would have been, ang- you know, yeah, you're absolutely right. A musical theatre writer would have pr- probably put the songs in a different place. Yeah, the songs that I particularly liked, I, I, uh, I liked the history of of wrong guys, which was Lauren, which was brilliant. I enjoyed the tango, which was What a Woman Wants, and the end of Act One, everybody says, yeah, because it, it that was a, a kind of, yeah, that's a, a good feel-good number. But it, it really wasn't anything that we've seen before. I thought the choreography was just really just a, a little bit old hat, to be completely honest. There was nothing special about it. And I got a bit old fed boot. up. Sorry? Or old boot. Old boot, yeah. We um, like the, um, the conveyor belt. And of course, it's very famous on that video from um, I don't know the name of the band. Okay, now or something like that. Yes. Um, um, so that, I mean, and it's effective. It works. I have no problem. Logo, with the logo. I think it. it's going to be about cornflakes. Looking about what? Looking at the logo, you think the show is going to be about Kellogg's cornflakes? Oh, but, <laughs> I hadn't noticed that, but you're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad we saw it in London and not America because I hear it's unbearable in America for a Brit. The yes. accents, but we still had them breaking out into American accents when they're singing well it, it, I didn't mind with um, I didn't mind with Lauren doing that because that was relevant because she was she was singing the kind of song that she would sing and it was it was kind of it was her emulating what would be in her song consciousness as a character um, and I had no problem with Lola no. Singing she's that, the performer and she's the performer. She's the um, uh, the the drag artist. I had no problem with that because I I thought that was relevant because she would have done big production numbers. I had a big problems with Charlie singing an American accent. It just made no sense to me whatsoever. I just it was purely to suit the song style. They didn't bother having any accents. It Nobody sort of had touches of northern. Yeah, words. now and again a word would come through, but um, <laughs> but but a slightly rounder vowel or something. Yes, or... there was one song that made no son- sense, which was "Take What You Got," which I, I, I was just like, "Why is this here?" It's "Take pointless. What You've Got," as we say in this part of the colony. Take what you got. Take what you got. Take what you. Oh, I'm saying it over and over again. Yes, <laughs> just like the song did. Take what you have. That was really a nothing song that made no point and didn't make any sense, and I it didn't add anything to the plot there was something with selling his friend a back locker's shoes or something and I, I, I oh yes this was the one <laughs> song in the pub that sounded like once yes I believe as so. interesting as a song in once the song I turned off during was not my father's son which had about one chord played on the piano for about seven and a half weeks and I don't and even remember that song it what was, was that? The, the yearning one where he sat on the bench and they both sung about their fathers yes which would have been more interesting had a musical theatre uh, lyricist yes. or and a writer written it. So um, yes, it was nice sentiment, but uh, there was a nice staging moment. So there was a nice moment where the young Charlie turns into the old Charlie with a nice bit of very yep. simple illusion going on. But very simple nice. and and very well done. Good introduction. Um, it, the set was a little bit ordinary yeah, reminded right. me of when I just saw School of Rock it was it, it was a nothing set really a it frame was, set it, it was what it needed to be we met a friend our friend Ruben last night after the show and he'd seen it and he had a lot to say about it don't make me stand up at the end yes the, the, that was a very much a 
um, a kind of device at the end, wasn't it? it was it it's was not like Bender like Beckham, where you have a song literally called "Everybody Stand Up." Uh, <laughs> I've picked up Jonathan Cohen's groan. Oh, oh. I think you know, um, I think Les Mis will have one soon, where they all oh. come back from the dead at the end, and, and they all yes, everyone stand up and walk in the aisles. I, yeah, I'd. I, out. Is this? I mean, that was really my first West End show that I've seen in a long time. Is this a normal thing for people to do standing ovations these days? I mean, it's an American thing, definitely. Yeah, I mean, the, as, as, as I've always said, the Americans will stand up at the opening of a fridge, but they whip you into a frenzy at the end. And I think Joseph was the first show to do it with the Mega Mix. Oh uh, yes, because it would have been yeah for children. Yeah. But that would have been because then it added that, another twenty that, minutes onto the show. But that is about. People, yeah, dancing into it. I mean, there must have been other cases. Buddy but Holly, I mean, the, I remember the Buddy story did it, but that you're, you're, you know, you're, you're in, in a concert. concert yes, he does so. die at the end, so they don't want to leave you on that downer. But the problem I, is, I, if I, one person stands up, everyone then has to stand up because it's a domino effect. Well, no, no, I don't think they do. But I want to have the choice of. Um, I mean, now there's two ways to look at this I stood up at the end you don't have to stand up no. at the end but I stood up at the end purely because I wanted, I wanted to see people come on for the curtain call however everybody in front of us could well have been standing up because they thought it was a show good enough to give a standing ovation so you, we do have to expect that you know it, that is a case but you do feel like you have to stand up if I go and stand up I want to see I want to stand up to give a standing ovation if I think it's a very good show. Yeah. Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. I was on my feet immediately because I, I really thought it was fantastic. Um, Melda Saunter comes out at Gypsy. You know, the whole yeah, place. Exactly. So, you know, standing a standing ovation really should be a... Deserved. A deserved flight. And I've been in shows where some people have stood up and some people haven't stood up. Um, so... I, I, I think a lot of it comes down to the fact I've paid a lot of money to see this show. So I'm going to go in to this show wanting to enjoy it. And I'm going to show my appreciation at the end. I think that's No, I don't I don't I don't because I don't think that I mean I paid a lot of money to go and see shows um and I haven't enjoyed them and so I don't feel any I'm not beholden to the show to stand up at the end no. and, and sh- say that I've enjoyed it if I haven't enjoyed it. The thing is, people love this show. That is the general consensus. Well, the, the, the other thing as well is that the people it, it maybe it, it appeals to, and uh, I mean, I'm generalising hugely here, and it's going to sound terribly rude, but I'm going to say it anyway, is that I, I think it is appealing to people who don't... who, who may listen to... Let me turn it around the other way. I my When I listen to... Uh, music as I'm walking along just day to day I will listen to a cast album I will listen to a film soundtrack I will listen to classical music I will listen to something that I create a story in my head I don't very often listen to rock or pop music by artists or albums so I don't have like an individual playlist because when I listen to a musical I want to listen to the whole thing in order I don't do playlists so, either. so yes it stresses me out <laughs> I believe this is a musical for people who do like playlists. They they do like random things. They don't necessarily like stories uh, when they're just listening to day-to-day music. So it, I, it, it is perfect for that because they're not really... The, the, the plot and the story becomes incidental. It's just a bunch of songs with a sound. So, um, I just noticed we have Jim Henson on the second keyboards. Ah, fantastic. That's very good going. I see his career has... Yes, indeed. ...taken off. Um... Now, th- there is room for that, and I just hope... And maybe things are changing slightly, but I, it, there was a worry for one time, and, and there is a worry with a lot of shows being written by pop artists, that they're, given being, they're giving, being given the chance to put shows on, whereas there's a lot of very good musical theatre writers who are not being given the chance to oh, put shows yeah, on. <coughs> <Damon Albarn. coughs> You're talking about people who've have been given the chance. I mean, they've got, they've got the yes, they've been given the money. They've been given the chance because they've they've got the uh, the name and the backing, and they can bring audiences in. Whereas someone who's starting in out, some cases they can provide financial. It, well, exactly. For the show but, as well. but but people who are writing uh, musical theatre writers, regardless of their talent, if they if they don't ha- have a name, that then they're relying purely on the content of the show. So consequently they're often not going to be touched by producers because they think, well, they're not going to bring buns and seeds, regardless of how good the show seems to be. Now, saying that, there are exceptions in the cases. I think I think it's 
probably harder here to get new writing on than in America. At least America and Broadway, they do uh, take chances, and that you do see new shows mm-hmm. and new um, musical but, theater but you writers. Could argue come this on. was even a risk with Cindy Lauper. No, I don't think it's no, musical it's, before. No, it's not a risk at all. It's 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 because you know that people are going to come in and dance and and clap along. So I don't think it's a risk. It may not particularly run very well mm-hmm. long here. Um, but it, it it's not a risk on site, and it's got that twee. The it's got the message thing, which is again, which I don't. It, I think it's just tacked Everything on. It's going to be okay at the end. Well, and I mean, why the, couldn't the factory have failed? What happens? Well, no, because I, it didn't. It didn't fail. So I mean, but we the, weren't told that it could have. They could have. Yeah, but it didn't fail in the real story. Yeah, but it, we never found out what happened after the fashion show. Yeah, yeah, you mean they didn't tie it up no. properly? They just kind of left it. Oh, the fashion show, and then all the drag yeah. queens came on at Were the, the end. Was a success? I want to know more. Yeah, they didn't. They didn't actually tell you. Yeah. I see what you mean. You I want Kinky yeah. Boots Never Dies to open at the Adolfi Theatre no, next year. No, please, please don't. Uh, we talked about this earlier about the mm. fact that it should have been set in the eighties. Yeah, the device of setting it modern times, I think, is that they can use mobile phones. Which they do, which is uh, so that because they wouldn't have been able to have the mobile phones if they set it in the period that it's meant to be that it actually happened. Mm. But you also said that somebody pointed out that in modern days there is no tax. Yes, shipping uh, tax I, I, I read online that there was uh, the the shipping tax from UK to continental Europe was slashed years and years ago. Uh, which is a main plot device yeah. and a main prop, which again... Which obviously happened in the 80s for the thing, you know, yes. in, in the film and, and stuff, but doesn't happen now. So by setting it in now, yeah. they actually ran up against a major plot point mm. which doesn't exist, which is very much Americans writing about England. You and I were both feel they didn't shove Cindy Lauper songs in it. Yeah, no, that even though they did, but. which is which is a weird one because we had this discussion, which was both, <laughs> which was both for and against that. Which is, in some ways, you're kind of going, oh, I wish they had had a song that was as well written as "Girls Just Want to Have Fun" or "True Colors." But at the same time, if they'd actually had that, I know I would have gone, oh, they put in "True Colors" or um, you know, "The Girls Just Want to Have Fun" because that's the Cindy Lauper hit. So. I'm glad they didn't, and at the same time, I wish they had. The girls' this one, I found, would have worked quite well for the drag act. It would have been very obvious. Yeah. Very obvious to do. Much like um, most of the show. Yes, exactly. I, I mean, it was... I didn't like the drag queens. It would, the, the dancing was just so... It was so mundane, and just... It wasn't exciting at all. It was... There was... Every movement was just a little bit... And it, it just... The drag queens just were... Dragged. I didn't see the point. It was just like bring them into each scene every time to um, just kind of... It didn't even work as a Greek chorus or anything like that. I, it just was a bit... I didn't see the point of that. But talking about... Let's end with the good points. So the audience definitely enjoyed it. That's a good point. Regardless of whether I did and whether and, you, and you did. And you and I both enjoyed it. There were moments that we yeah. de- definitely enjoyed it. I didn't walk out humming any songs. In fact, I walked out humming um, No One Mourns the Wicked for some bizarre reason because I saw it on the back of the programme so I started singing Wicked. The other one was the ensemble and work together. They look like they're having fun. They they really are having a you know well of a time. Ask around, they either. didn't ask around, which is something that I used to see on the West End stage and it used to annoy the hell out of me, which is you felt the um and I think that maybe that's a generation war one thing. There's a much older cast with this. I feel the ensemble is is older. Mm. Matt Henry was excellent as Lola. Killian Donnelly, I wanted to like him, but it's a nothing part. He was a good performer, but Charlie is just, it's just a bit bland, really. Uh, Charlie and and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is just a bit bland. Is he really? I haven't seen it. So, um, uh, but for me, the the star of the show was certainly Amy Lennox. Or Amy Lennox. Can she have her own show, please? She should. I noticed that she'd, um, she was the understudy for Elle Wood, so I assume she must have gone on. And she's done some great stuff. Uh, yeah, no, she she was su- superb. I mean, I I would I would go and see another show if she were in it. She were in it, and I'm a big woofter, so you know. But I I I love seeing a performance. Homosexual for those <laughs> not on our shores. Really, me? Yes, I thought she was a. I think she. You have a woman crush, don't you, Dom? <laughs> no, it's not that. I have an admiration for watching a fantastic perform. perform a performer, an actress, an actor. Um, 
a performer, an actor. Who takes material and lifts it to another level. Just really. But how much of that is the direction? I don't know. Maybe that's what the character's like in all the shows. Well, like, it could be, but but she did it very well. And, you know, it doesn't... It, and the fact that I found most of the direction a bit bland... And if it is that point, why weren't all the characters directed that well? Well, it, you, well because the characters weren't that interesting. Yeah. So I'm saying if Lauren is that interesting, it must have been a, a, an actress choice over a director uh, or a choice. I don't know. It could be either. But, it, but it, the bottom line is, whether it's direction or her... She does come across as a an excellent performer. She she works her ass off and makes it look effortless, which is uh, a sign of uh, a star, I believe. So I I think she was awesome. So I would go and see something else that she's in, and Matt Henry she's as well. Kinky, she's in Kinky Boots. Though. Yeah, I won't go and see that again, <laughs> but I will go and see her in other things. You, you go and see it again just for that five minutes she has her song. Yeah, and they are releasing a London cast recording of this, a live one, so you can listen to her perform again. Marvelous! Your carpet needs hoovering. Yes. Um, Matt Henry is very good as well. I, I would see him again, and probably Killian Donnelly. I mean, all the cast. I've enjoyed Killian good, so. in. I've seen him in The Commitments and uh, Memphis, and he's very good. See, I think his direction was probably bad because I. I think it's it's just not a. It's a bit of a sad because it's for the lead. It's a very uninteresting character. There's no. I think the lead should be swapped. I don't think Killian Donnelly's a lead. He's the. He's the. It's He's definitely... the person the story revolves around. I think Lola is the... They have good chemistry on stage, yeah, the two of them. It's like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Wonka is the lead. Oh, I see. I understand what you mean. But, but Charlie, Charlie is, is a lead. Yeah, but he's the kind of first person we meet, so we think that's the... the you know, the, the well, the lead doesn't necessarily have to no. be one character in a show, but it is definitely... Charlie is the main character. Yeah. I mean, there's no denying that, but it's just a bit of a bland character. However, the relationship and the, the chemistry between... Uh, Killian Donnelly and Matt Henry on stage was very good. So. To be honest, I was expecting the two of them to fall in love. Were you? Oh, that never crossed my mind in no. a million years. No. Maybe that'll be in a sequel. <laughs> yes. You're listening to Musical Talk. Dominic McChesney there with me, Nick Hudson. Thank you very much for listening to that. I'd like to apologise for my sort of radio silence that's been happening lately. It hasn't been very well. I've been very busy with uh, various music projects, which I'm sure we'll be able to talk about on the show soon. But I've got some interesting stuff coming up on the podcast for the future. For example, uh, Musical Talk veterans Mike Dixon and Emma Williams are, this very night I'm recording this and the night I'm releasing this episode, just about to open in Mrs Henderson Presents at the Noel Coward Theatre in Leicester. To Square, which I'm very much looking forward to seeing, and I'm looking forward to sharing my views on that show and possibly talking to Mike and Emma about the piece. We're hoping to have Louise Dearman on in the future, so that should be good. And uh, Robert will be back, and Dom will be back on talking about the shows that he saw when he was here Matilda, Child and Chocolate Factory, and a couple of other things. Please make sure you're following us on Twitter at twitter.com slash musical talk or Facebook at facebook.com slash musical talk. Check out our website at musicaltalkpodcast.weebly.com where every single episode is stored for your listening delight. Thank you very much for listening and I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye.